production of Ruckus is made possible through the generous support of Dave and Jamie Cummings, the Hartwig family, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Ruckus, our weekly Food for Thought fight over the news of the day and the trends of the times. I'm Mike Shannon. The Ruckettes join me shortly and our topics this week, a new chief executive in Missouri, the nation's chief executive bids farewell, and voters may say farewell to streetcar expansions, plus roast and toast. But we start with our newsmaker segment and talk about organized labor in Kansas City and beyond. Labor unions are strong allies of the Democratic Party, and the past six years have not been good ones for the party of FDR. Democrats have lost control of most state legislatures and governor's offices. A right to work law seems likely in Missouri, something unions have fought against for years. Republicans also have firm control of the U.S. Congress, and in just a few days, a Republican will succeed a Democrat in the White House. So what will be the consequences for the labor movement? To discuss that and more is Judy Ansel, Director of Worker Education and Labor Studies at UMKC. Judy, welcome to Ruckus. Thanks for coming in. Thanks, Mike. It's a pleasure to be here. Let's talk a bit about uh, right to work. Do you see that as the biggest issue facing labor in the metro area and throughout the my state area? Well, I think clearly labor sees it as the biggest issue. It's, um, it's kind of a deal breaker as far as collective bargaining is concerned because it's a direct attack on unions. It's a direct attack on, on uh, workers' rights to and, and Just, just explain, in essence, what right to work <laughs> is. It means that an employee well, in a company represented by a union doesn't have to pay dues. Right. B basically, it outlaws the ability of uh, a, a company and its union to make an agreement that all of the workers would either pay dues or pay for the bargaining services that the union under law is required to give them. So it's as if, let's, let's say you, you live in Kansas City, you're a taxpayer in Kansas City, and you have a referendum to build a community center or a library. And the majority of people vote to do that. But then it, uh, this kind of law would give the right to a citizen to say, Not pay I don't want to pay the that, taxes. That program, yeah. Right, so, so basically it undercuts the ability of the union financially, but it also divides the workers. Yeah. And so it's seen by unions what, as an, a, a direct attack on their Why do you think power. union leaders can't convince employees to join? Why they can't point out what they believe are the benefits of union membership? Well, you know, most people in a unionized workplace do join mm -hmm. a union. It's a minority who drop out. Uh, they call th those people are pe people who want to take advantage of a, a of, of a free ride, basically. And what the legislature is doing in passing right to work is giving an incentive to people who want to take advantage of the system or want now, to gain the system. Uh, lawmakers would say Republican lawmakers would say it makes the state more pro business and business friendly. Well, it may, yeah, but it also is going to make the state poorer. I mean, there's numerous studies that show that right-to-work states, workers make less money, but also the states l lose a tremendous amount. We're talking billions of dollars in tax revenue that um, is going to impact a state's budget. The majority well. of states now have right-to-work, I believe. I right. think the count is 27. Uh, I yes, think Kentucky, with, with Kentucky just, this week, and, yes. and Missouri, I think it's fair to say, probably right. uh, will become a right-to-work state right. before very long. Another issue that I know you've been very involved with is the minimum wage mm -hmm. area in Kansas City. You're hoping to get the minimum wage for entry-level workers at raised. $15 an hour, roughly, over a period of time. Mm -hmm. uh, do you see any progress in that area? Well, there was a tremendous amount of progress when Kansas City uh, passed yeah. an increase in the minimum wage two years but ago. But I think the state legislature the state said that wasn't within the purview of the, the city. the cities that they don't have the right to do that, and they preempted. That's still in the courts and, and being decided whether or not the legislature did that properly. So the, uh, we'll, we'll see. But clearly, state legislatures that are controlled by Republicans across the country are moving to take away the rights of people in cities to determine what their regulations are going to Back be. Back to right to work for just a second. If uh -huh. Missouri passes that law, and we assume that'll be the case, will labor leaders try to get an initiative petition on the ballot in 2018 to overturn it? I think that's a possibility. I, I don't think that's been decided yet. I think that 
the leadership of um, the state's unions are still discussing what options they have, but clearly there will be a reaction. Down to about 30 seconds, one final question. Uh -huh. I saw a quote attributed to you, I assume it's accurate, that you said, a cabinet filled with CEOs and generals is not in workers' best interest. Obviously, you're talking about the appointees. I said that? To, well, you're <laughs> quoted as saying that. Do you not believe that? A cabinet filled with CEOs and generals is not, not in the in workers', workers best, best interest? Yeah, I would agree with that. Why, quickly, why? Why? Because you don't have the voice of working people. You don't have the experience of working people. CEOs have their own interests, and they're different. But they have achieved people. a great deal in their own lives. They may have say? achieved Generals a great deal, but they, but, but they have very different interests and experiences. We'll have to talk about this some other time. I have because we're out of time now. Thank Judy, so thank you very much for coming in. It's good okay. to see you. Thanks. That is Judy Ansel, Director of Worker Education and Labor Studies at UMKC. Now let's meet the panel and start a ruckus. Steve Rose is a longtime Johnson County civic leader and is a columnist for the Kansas City Star. Gwen Grant is president and CEO of the Urban League in Kansas City. Lisa Johnston is a political consultant and writer. And Patrick Tuohy is manager of the Show Me Institute, a libertarian think tank in Kansas City. Welcome to all of you. Thanks for coming in. It's good to see you all again. Missourians now have a new governor. Many Kansas apparently wish they did as well. The state legislatures have reconvened in Jefferson City and Topeka. Both states have Republican governors and Republican-controlled legislatures. But let's start with the Show Me State, where it appears lawmakers will concentrate on four areas, right to work, school choice, ethics reform, and corporate tax cuts. But the new Missouri governor, Eric Greitens, is not talking about corporate tax cuts in the same way Kansas Governor Brownback did. There's a big difference, and the Show Me Institute likes that difference. And what is that difference, Patrick? Uh, well, it's a great opportunity. What the governor is suggesting is something that Show Me has advocated for a long time, which is you can get rid of the corporate income tax in Missouri and also get rid of the tax credits, corporate tax credits, and you end up being able to pay it's for that It's a balancing tax act. That's exactly right. And so what it does is it cuts taxes for everybody in the state rather than collecting taxes from everybody and then selectively giving them back to a few. And talk about how tax credits are used. Well, it, it depends on the program, and there are a lot of programs in Missouri. But, but they rehabilitate old buildings, that sort of well, thing. Well, that's what they say. Sure, what it does is it incentivizes a, a business to do something it might not otherwise do. Sometimes that can be good. A lot of times that's bad. Sound like a good idea to you, uh, balancing it between... <coughs> Sounds a whole lot better than what we're doing in Kansas, <laughs> I can tell you that. At least they're going to balance the budget that way. It's a different way of approaching government, but I don't have any quarrel with what Missouri's doing. I have a quarrel with what Kansas yeah. is doing. Now, has that been a proposal by Greitens at this point in the legislative session? Uh, what, what, to tax? Well, the, the tax credit. Uh, well, it's something he's talked about, yeah. and, and I think there are going to be a lot of fans of it in the legislature. Okay, over in Topeka, Governor Sam Brownback is entering the final two years of his second term. He gave his State of the State speech Tuesday evening. He probably wishes it had been his farewell address. The state has had more than its share of problems, most dealing with money. So, Lisa, did Brownback offer any concrete solutions in his State of the State? Well, the governor did not offer the solutions in the state of the state. He left the dirty work for Sean Sullivan <laughs> from the budget office to reveal yesterday. And so here are some of the highlights of the governor's plan. Uh, first, to raid the highway fund of nearly $600 million over the next two and a half years, delaying any new projects until 2019. Also, selling off the proceeds from the tobacco settlement, which the state was to get uh, $60 million a year for 30 years, and so they're trying to sell that off for $530 million over the next two years, losing the state $1.27 billion in total. Then there was a poo-poo platter of sin taxes. Uh, there was uh, an increase on alcohol from 8 to 16 percent, increase on cigarettes, uh, $1.29 a pack to $2.29 a pack, increase on other tobacco, 10 percent to 20 percent, and those are likely to be extraordinarily unpopular, not only with users of the products, but with merchants who sell them, especially those by the state but, but, line. But, but the governor does not want to get rid of the LLC exemption. Correct. He had a minuscule uh, twist on that. The exemption remains in place, he said, however, they could tax rent and royalties if any of those entities receive those, but he wants to retain the exemption. So his small change would bring in $40 million, whereas 
repealing the exemption overall would bring in 250 million, which many people are in favor and, of. And the deficit now is about 350 million for this year, I think. For Steve. this year, yeah. but <coughs> so, so a what billion happens, dollars over the So season. what happens now? Governor Brownback has submitted his budget plan, and the legislature does what? Well, I think the legislature is going to go on its own pretty much now, uh, much more than it used to because of the moderates that were elected in the last general election and Democrats. Um, I, I think that um, the LLC exemption is gone. I just think, I think that's going to get repealed. I think even if, he, if the governor vetoes it, I think there'll be enough votes to override the veto. I think that's gone. That's $250 million right there. The settlement with the tax, the uh, tobacco money, uh, is not going to go, I don't believe, anywhere at all. They tried that a couple of years ago and it didn't go anywhere and it's, it's very unpopular because the money goes for children's programs and nobody wants to cut children's programs. So Gwen, does this make you glad you live in Missouri? <laughs> well, yes, but uh, I am concerned about Missouri, though. I, what what concerns was, you about Missouri? Well, we have to wait and see what our new governor is going to do. We have a, a state legislature that is uh, majority Republican. There's no balance in, of power at the state level. And we have, you know, a very conservative uh, legislature. I'm concerned about health care coverage, education. Uh, I, I'm concerned that they may, uh, you know, come back with an assault on, on our earnings tax, which is very essential to Kansas City. I mean, we have a lot of concerns. How likely is that, Patrick, that the new governor will raise the question about the earnings tax in Kansas well, City? Well, I think it's something that Kansas City and St. Louis are going to struggle with because what's happening in Kansas City and St. Louis, they are a Jolie Justice, uh, a Kansas City Councilwoman just recently described those two cities as the economic engine of Missouri, and that's true, but they're a drag. Uh, high taxes, high regulation in the cities, plus its other problems with education and crime, are chasing people out of the state. The entire state of Missouri is suffering because these two cities can't get their act together. And we do know, Gwen, that the new governor is not interested in ceding control of the police department know, to the local government. I know, that's really unfortunate. I strongly disagree with the governor on that. As you know, I'm a proponent of, of local control. And, you know, the, the city funds the police department. The city should control the police department. It's, you know, it's shameful that we're the only state in the country where the, you know, without local so control. only city, only major only city, city in the yeah. country, I think, uh, yeah, where it's the totally, police department is not controlled by the local government. It makes no sense at all. All right. It looks like the plan to systematically enlarge the new streetcar <clears throat> system in Kansas City just hit a roadblock. A new group is calling for a citywide vote, not just a vote within the expansion district, before streetcar service can expand. In other words, expansion would not just be decided by voters in a two or three mile area, it would be voted on throughout Kansas City, Missouri. Now, if the group's petition drive is successful and future expansion efforts face a citywide vote, Steve, will that help or hurt expansion enthusiasts? It'll. Uh kill expansion <laughs> and, be, and for the same reason that the airport will have such difficulty passing because people who don't fly or don't fly very often have no vested interest in a new airport and the same thing is true with the streetcars if you do not use them or you do not benefit from them directly or indirectly and you live somewhere else in Kansas City you're going to ask the question why should my taxes be raised to help something that I'm not ever going to use. It's a very, very difficult sell. What about that, Gwen? Well, I think, I think Steve's right about that. I, but I think that many people uh, in the community would like to see more investment in transportation that will get people to work more so than the, what they consider the touristy, frou-frou aspect of, of the streetcar uh, as it current, currently uh, is, is structured. I, you know, I, I think what they want is the opportunity to vote for the tax as opposed to having this one little area, only this area votes on it, but it impacts everyone still, whether you ride it How or so? not, it does. How does it well, impact Well, it impacts, it, it impacts you if you're driving and they're put, when they're during the construction period of it, uh, lots of changes, people are concerned about well, and, those And I think if there are well. utility costs involved, Every, those are paid for by the entire city and not yeah, just by so the, not the just, district yeah. that's served by the streetcar expansion. Right, so whether you are a pro or anti anti, you know, you don't, whether you ride it or not, I think people uh, have some valid concerns, but uh, wanting to see a transportation system that will get people to areas where our local transit, the bus service, does not uh, get them. And I think that's, that's a, a greater priority to folks than just having a streetcar that'll go from downtown uh, to the plaza, even though I think, you know, it's good for tourism, it's good for 
uh, you know, convention business and things like that, but I think practical things like transportation systems that get people to jobs. I think that some people are concerned that we don't have enough information and maybe it's too much of a novelty and we need to see whether or not the expansion is really needed. The, re the bottom line is that Kansas City is a car culture and that people haven't adjusted to the idea of mass transit and there's also prioritization. I think a lot of people feel that things like infrastructure might be more important than streetcar expansion. And Patrick, we don't know for sure that uh, the public is going to vote on this idea of citywide votes to expand streetcars. Well, that's right. And the city council has showed a pension in the past for not wanting to vote on petition efforts. And then it's a matter of when do we vote on it, do we vote on it before. But I think what everybody said is exactly right. The reason why proponents of a streetcar don't want a citywide vote is because history has shown they lose. Yeah. And, and this is all complicated by... Clay Chastain, <laughs> who, who say what you will about him, has another petition, right. yes. and it's been certified that well, he has yeah. enough signatures, and he's mm -hmm. carrying on that the city is ignoring it and won't mm -hmm. put it on the ballot. I do not understand. I mean, I guess I do understand, because I, I think this is all kind of different versions of a bad idea, but Clay Chastain is the only person who has passed a citywide vote right. on the streetcar, and I think the city picked a fight with him early on to their detriment. Yeah, he, he had a light rail proposal on the ballot in 2006. Now, he's had about 11 other ones, <laughs> but the one in 2006 passed, and if I recall correctly, that was the time that Claire McCaskill was first on the ballot for the U.S. Senate, and I think there was a proposal to raise the state's minimum wage, you know, and so there was a huge turnout. And there turnout. was no opposition. And, opposition and, to the streetcar thought this doesn't have a chance. Well, it, before, it was light rail. Uh, right. I mean, there you may have not to give, be much of a discussion. You have His yeah. petitions are a dream to move the city forward. All the other petitions I've seen and read about are coming at the city in order to negate or to void what the city council is wanting to do in the mayor. So at least you got to give Chastain credit for wanting to do something positive for the city. Gwen, streetcar, is it a success? Well, it seems to be. Uh, you know, Based on what? Ridership. ridership? Yeah. Hasn't it declined pretty dramatically Has when it? the weather turned a little colder? Well, yeah. so, so, the, so to, to Gwen's point, the, yes, the streetcar ridership has gone down in the winter. That is absolutely not a surprise. It will be, right. I, here's a prediction. It will be shut down this weekend because of a nice storm. <laughs> yeah. uh, the whole system will be shut down and, <laughs> and, and uh, buses will be driving back. past the streetcar. But the reason why it's, it's suffered uh, such decline is because people don't use it to commute. Yeah. Right. Uh, a transit system that people actually use to get to work Thank don't you. suffer as much of a decline because people use it for a real purpose, not just Again, sure. Well, we're going to be shut down if I don't move on to the next topic. <laughs> President Barack Obama is getting set to exit okay. stage left. After eight years in the Oval Office and a wide-ranging farewell address on Tuesday evening, Obama urged black Americans to tie their struggle for justice to the challenges others face, including, in his words, the middle-aged white man who has seen his world upended by economic, cultural, and technological change. Then Obama defined the challenge for white Americans. It means acknowledging that the effects of slavery and Jim Crow didn't suddenly vanish in the 60s. That when minority groups voice discontent, they're not just engaging in reverse racism or practicing political correctness. When they wage peaceful protests, they're not demanding special treatment, but the equal treatment that our founders promised. Obama's election would change the way Americans look at the issue of race relations. But Mary Sanchez in the Kansas City Star said his tenure in office has neither enhanced the idea of improved racial relations or have we seen race relations decline while he has been president. Do you agree with that? I, I agree with Mary for the most part. I thought her editorial was, was well done. Um, but, you know, I think that his election, well, first of all, I did not ever subscribe to the notion that electing a black president would somehow make us post-racial in America. Um, and actually, my experience has, uh, from my vantage point and from the vantage point of many of my colleagues, uh, we seem to believe that his election uh, raised the level of explicit bias um, in the country. I think people... Uh, there seemed to be a lot more um, willingness to explicitly uh, voice 
uh, their opinions about race or negativity or towards uh, not only the, the president, but just as far as race is overall. Um, so it declined. Race relations I, I declined think, during it, Obama's yeah, I administration. I think it declined. I think the, the, the current climate uh, in this past uh, election year was very divisive and um, certainly had tones of racism and bigotry and, and a lot of the commentary coming from the right. Uh, and, and I think people, somehow the, the lid has been blown off and you have a lot of this uh, going on on social media as well. Uh, so uh, I think, um, yeah, I, I think it's kind of a mixed bag. So Steve, you think racism is alive and well in America? You wrote a column last weekend about a friend of yours who, who pointed out to you that uh, this is a black man and talked to you about how race uh, intolerance continues. I think there's been improvement, but I do think that race, racism and race is a major, major issue in this country. Uh, I noticed that a lot of people, however, when they responded to the column, said what Gwen was touching on, which is that, okay, how can you say there's racism in this country when we just elected in a black president? As if that Well, it alone, does say something, doesn't it? I, I said, mean, when, when, and you, and I, I, when I you and I were growing up, people said, said there will never be a black man elected right. president. Absolutely. So that's the first progress. words out of my mouth yeah. were, I think there's been great improvement, mm -hmm. and there has been. But it exists, and it is a major force. And I do think it was a factor in the Trump victory. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, and people can argue with that, but I think it was a factor, and I think that Trump played to that factor during his campaign. Lisa, did you watch the farewell address? I did. What did you think? I thought, as usual, he was very eloquent, and parts of it were touching. I thought he did a nice job and urged everyone to stay involved and stress the importance of remaining true to your civic duty and staying involved as a citizen. What does he do now when he leaves the White House? Is he <laughs> the most prominent Democrat in the country? Is he the titular certainly, head of the absolutely. Democratic Party? Well, certainly he's very prominent. Now, the question is, how vocal will he be? And we don't know that yet. I suspect he will not go silently into that good night. No. He will, I think, remain on the scene and continue to express his opinions about various topics. Well, I think Lisa's right, uh, but to the detriment to the next uh, group of people who want to run for president. Uh, there's not going to be much oxygen left in the room if you've got Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, and President Obama uh, taking the limelight. But let me say, in regards to what the expectation was of Obama and, and what he was able to deliver, I think it's not so much uh, specific to President Obama. We tend to put all our hopes and fears on the President of the United yeah. States, who has very little ability to affect those. Uh, you know, um, uh, John Edwards said that if uh, he and John Kerry were elected, people like Christopher Reeve would walk again. Uh, Obama <laughs> said that, uh, you know, this is the generation that would see the oceans right, recede. Right. I mean, it's, it's silliness. Uh, politicians are never as good as we hope or as bad as we fear. All right, we've got to wrap it up. Uh, we're going to head now to the soapbox for Roast and Toast, where the Ruckets have 30 seconds each to legitimize or criticize people and events in the news. And we start with Gwen. I'm roasting the U.S. Senate for moving forward to repeal Obamacare without any vision of a replacement, to remove 20 million people from insurance, to take us backwards so that people who have been able to become insured with pre-existing conditions may no longer have that coverage, to move forward with full speed and without any plan is totally reckless and un just unconscionable. Patrick. Uh, a toast to the Missouri Department of Transportation for its recently completed repairs of the Grand Boulevard Bridge. Uh, I understand uh, what took them nine months normally takes three years, and that's great news for all of Kansas City. Uh, imagine what Kansas City would be like if all our infrastructure and transit needs were dealt with with such focus. Steve Rose. In a sign of the times, we're losing two iconic, uh, this is a toast, Two iconic stores in the Prairie Village area, Bruce Smith Drugs and Tiffany Town, both of which are over 50 years old. It's just, it's just sad. It's part of life. But it's, I think it's very sad that we're losing yet more mom and pop stores. What are those stores, by the way? Tiffany Town sells cards and novelties right. and things, and Bruce Smith Drugs was an yeah. ind independent drugstore, one of the last in the country. It had been there forever, hadn't it? Yes. All right, uh, Lisa. 
State Senator Denning said last week that some Kansas lawmakers are interested in instituting a 5% flat income tax in Kansas. So my roast is for those in that camp. Don't be fooled by those who are trying to pull the wool over the eyes of Kansans by leaning into the fact that 5% is only 0.4% more than the current top tax bracket rate. If instituted, this would be significant and disproportionate. A family with a taxable income of $30,000 would see their income tax bill go up 85%, whereas a family making $200,000 in taxable income would see only a 16% increase, which is still significant. Kansas may need to pay more tax, but we need to keep the percent of the increase flat, not the rate. And finally, here is a golden roast to the Golden Globes this past Sunday. I tuned in hoping to see an award show honoring motion picture and television actors and performers. And yes, that was part of it, but mostly it seemed like a left-wing political rally featuring bitter partisans whose candidate lost the presidential election. Based on that, I can only imagine what excitement the Oscars will bring this year. And that's Ruckus for this week. We're back next Thursday at 7. Now for the Ruckettes and the crew, I'm Mike Shannon saying thanks very much for watching and good night. Production of Ruckus is made possible through the generous support of Dave and Jamie Cummings, the Hartwig family, and by viewers like you. Thank you.